This is a presentation on our excavations at the Dorsey in 2019 and our earlier excavations in 2002 and how we put them into context with other works we carried out, what's known about the Dorsey and what we think uh, the Dorsey might mean. Uh, the Dorsey is a sort of a kidney shaped enclosure. It measures uh, about 800 metres, uh, approximately north east to south west and about 400 metres in the other direction. Uh, it is uh, composed uh, mostly of earthen banks. Uh, the earthen banks are best preserved uh, in the southwest and the southeast of the enclosure. Uh, the map that you see in front of you is an Ordnance Survey map, a first edition Ordnance Survey map from the 1830s, and it shows the monument in a little bit better condition than it is today. In the 1830s, it's clear that most of the monument was easily traceable on the ground. The ramparts were large, uh, well preserved. Uh, today it's only those uh, southwestern and southeastern components which are well preserved. Uh, for much of the rest of the monument it's either untraceable or it's traceable but in a much reduced uh, condition. Uh, smaller and less well preserved than it was even 200 years ago and certainly uh, a lot less well preserved than when it was originally in use in the Iron Age. Uh, to give you a little bit better of an idea of what those uh, ramparts look like on the ground, this is a LIDAR survey uh, of the Dorsey. LIDAR is a fascinating technique. It's a sort of a light uh, radar, laser radar, uh, that fires millions, billions of, uh, of, of laser beams at the ground and they bounce back to the meter and uh, from that uh, data uh, a topographical survey can be built up. Uh, it has the wonderful ability to look through undergrowth if you set it to do such. And uh, the undergrowth has been stripped off this uh, this 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 lidar survey in front of us. And you can see in the centre uh, right of the photograph uh, the embankments, the undulating embankments uh, of the southwest uh, part of the Dorsey, uh, where the the current Bonds Road passes through the Dorsey and you can see they're very well preserved there and they uh, stand many metres, many metres high uh, and uh, considering that they've been filling in gradually for about 2,000 years uh, that's really very impressive. Uh, you can follow the Dorsey uh, on the north side of the monument uh, for part of its distance, part of its extent where it sort of is, uh, is, is currently a sort of an earthwork, uh, sort of a a bank in the field about a metre to a metre and a half high, much smaller than the earthworks uh, on the south side of the monument uh, where they're many metres high and, uh, and there's only one uh, there's only one embankment on the north side of the monument as opposed to several embankments on the southwestern and also the southeastern side of the monuments. And I really would like to draw your attention to the road running through the monument here. This is the Bonds Road that's what it's called nowadays. And it comes up uh, through the monument and along this ridge, this Esker ridge really, sort of a natural ridge. And then it sort of splits in two with, with one part going to the east and the other part uh, going to the west and uh, throughout the other side of the Dorsey. Uh, we know that this is an ancient road pretty much already. Uh, we think it is a branch of the Great North Road uh, from Tara, which was called the Schliemann Lüchra. Uh, and um, early medieval historical documents tell us that this road was well constructed or maybe discovered is a better term uh, in the first century AD. Discovered is the term that's used in some of the ancient poetry in a, in a book called the Metrical Dinshanachus. Dinshanachus is sort of lower of old places. And this is a collection of poetic sources which were gathered together by monks in the 11th century. Now, some of the poems are much older than that. And the poem that talks about the Shli Midlöchra and the other roads, the Shli Dala and Shli Moor and others, it's a very ancient poem. It uh, has very ancient uh, rhythmical structures and it probably dates to the 7th or 8th century. But uh, that, that poem uh, describes this road uh, which runs through the Dorsey. It doesn't explicitly mention the Dorsey itself, but it talks quite a lot about uh, this road and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit later on because the positioning of the road running through the Dorsey here is, is, is very very significant. 
this is a LIDAR survey of the southeastern side, and you can see uh, in the sort of uh, center left, center bottom left of your of, of the image in front of you, you can see the uh, earthworks here. Uh, there is a break in the earthworks, uh, much as there's a break in the earthworks on the eastern side, but it's not sure if this break is an original break or if it's a recent break or what antiquity it is. Uh, you can just about in the LIDAR follow uh, the now filled in Dorsey embankments along the west and cur curving up onto the northwest of the monument and then it finally runs out in the middle of the picture and you can't see much more until you pick it up on the other side uh, where we looked at uh, a minute ago. Uh, this is an aerial photograph of the Dorsey. Uh, it's quite hard to see an aerial photograph. You can just about see the rather overgrown uh, bits of the ramparts in the south east and in the southwest corners but much of the rest of it is quite hard to see from aerial photographs unless the unless the light's shining from a good angle and you get shadow or something like that it's very hard to see there is also a standing stone uh, within the dorsey uh, this is a photograph uh, of uh, dr phil barrett and dr jill plunkett from queens uh, that i took in 2002 along with uh, Sam Burns. Sam Burns is a landowner in the area and uh, a font of knowledge about all things uh, folklore uh, and, uh, and, and cultural heritage in the South Armagh area. He was, was the late Sam Burns, was a really interesting uh, man, very enjoyable company, and he took us up one day to Standing Stone. Uh, the Dorsey, of course, does not exist in isolation. The Dorsey is an enclosure which is part of a network of uh, banks which run uh, across the what may have been the southern frontier or southern boundary or southern border uh, of Ulster uh, in ancient times. Uh, this is an early 19th century map that shows a number of these earthworks that are in the south, so a south Ulster, so sort of north Connacht uh, area. And uh, you can send in fact that matter North Leinster also. And you can see that the, the Dorsey is just uh, in, in, in South Armagh. But there are other, the dark lines are other stretches of earthworks. Some uh, some extant in the early 19th century, some still extant today. And some that were remembered, but not necessarily extant at the time. Uh, it seems that this uh, these series of banks uh, close off high ground and good ground in South Ulster but it may well be that they also uh, run through uh, bogs and, and, and lakes and the like but where the boundary runs through bogs and lakes but it's not marked in the same way because there's no need to of course because uh, it's only really necessary to mark the boundary on the dry land that people regularly cross. Alternatively it may be as we'll see in a minute, with, similarly with the Dorsey, that in places which are very waterlogged sometimes, uh, palisades or similar stone or not stone wooden uh, posts, fences will be placed uh, in the ground uh, instead. And over the past sort of, <coughs> couple of decades, uh, rescue excavation has actually found a couple of extra sections of the Black Pig's Dyke, uh, this great uh, earthwork, a couple of sections which were not previously known about. So. Uh, we may be able to find out a lot more about these monuments as time goes on and as more work takes place. Uh, this is a plan of the Dorsey showing uh, the archaeological excavations which have taken place there. But there's actually been quite a lot of archaeological excavation in the Dorsey over the years. Uh, most of it has been quite small scale. Uh, and that's, that, that's, that's fine. We've learned a lot of information from that, actually. A couple of the excavations have been a little bit more intense. Um, the recent ones, the ones carried out in the past few decades, have had the full commit of uh, scientific archaeological backup, maybe carbon dates, general chronological dates, environmental analysis, things like that, which have fleshed out our knowledge uh, very much about, uh, about the monument. Uh, one of the first excavations to be carried out was carried out by Oliver Davies in the 1930s. Oliver Davies dug in several locations across the Dorsey, but probably the most important one was uh, here, uh, points B, C and D on this illustration. Uh, he uh, he found uh, several different things. We set out to find uh, primarily if the gap 
for the Bond's Road, the gap that the Bond's Road runs through, if that was an original gap, or whether uh, it has been knocked through by the people who were sort of building the road, if you like, constructing the road, if they had dug a hole through the Dorsey to make way for the road, or if the road had followed a pre-existing gap. And he quite quickly established that there was a causeway left, there was a gap left in the original Dorsey ramparts for, the, for a road to run through, of which the Bonds Road is the successor. In C and D, you can see lines of black dots. Those are post holes, and uh, those are those, those are the Palisade trenches that Davies found on his side of the road. He thought there were maybe something associated with gate-like structure or similar, uh, but we think, of course, now from the products or the findings of our excavations in 2002 and in 2019 that they are something rather different than that. Uh, in trench B, you'll notice that there are uh, a circular setting or settings of posts. And this is uh, some sort of a structure, a round structure, a building, which Oliver Davies found. And he interpreted it back in the 30s as a, a guardhouse. He thought this was uh, the place where guards waited uh, to come out and, uh, and, and uh, sort of go stop who goes there as people passed into uh, the Dorsey. And uh, this is, relates to one of the interpretations uh, of the Dorsey, uh, one of the interpretations as to what its significance is. Uh, the Dorsey at 800 metres uh, in one direction and 400 metres in the other is, is really too large to be a fort. And it covers too many different types of topography uh, to be a fort. Uh, but the idea that it defines some sort of crossing point on the way into Ulster which may have many different functions, both practical functions, such as guards stopping people and possibly extracting tax or tribute or a toll as they went along the road, is one possibility. And of course, there are other possibilities too. Journeys uh, involve rites of passage, just as much as the journey through life involves rites of passage. And uh, uh, those rites of passage, those Journeys are often, those transitional points are often marked in certain ways in many cultures. Uh, the airport departure lounge or our arrival lounge, perhaps. Uh, there is much ritual zones where we produce our documents and we get uh, uh, examined, if you like, in one form or another, as much as they are practical zones for enforcing uh, the authority of the state. They work on multiple different levels, and it's likely that the same was true about somewhere like the Dorsey, which seems to be an authorised crossing point, an authorised route through an ancient landscape, which otherwise, uh, where, where, where otherwise, movement is constrained by this Black Pig's Dyke, this a great linear earthwork running along the southern boundary of Ulster. Uh, Dr Chris Lynn of the uh, then Northern Ireland Environment Agency, now the Historic Environment Division of the Department for Communities, carried out a number of digs at the Dorsey back in the 1970s. Uh, those led to really interesting findings. He uh, first of all put a trench across the rampart on the north side of the Dorsey. He, uh, he dug through the bank and he also dug through the ditch. And uh, he got lots of samples for dating uh, from both under the bank and also uh, wood samples from the, uh, from the ditch itself. And this allowed two types of dating. It allowed radiocarbon dating but also it allowed the much more precise technique of dendrochronological or tree ring dating to be used. And I'll talk a little bit more about the dates uh, that Chris Lynn got in a minute or two. Uh, in addition, he dug in the uh, southwest of the monument, and uh, there he found, tucked inside the ditch, uh, a stretch of policy and running roughly parallel to the ditch and bank, uh, the ramparts of the, the monument. Uh, when I say palisade, I mean really stout posts all packed together in the manner of a stockade if you like it's different from a fence a fence is post uprights and then uh sort of horizontal rails or in modern case often wire uh, but a palisade is different they're all uprights and it's a very 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 strong type of fence and uh, the posts were preserved because it was quite waterlogged uh, where he was excavating and there's a, a photograph of some of those uh, preserved oak posts uh, you can see both the oak uprights, uh, and you can also see the oak packing timbers. 
packed in along the sides of the uprights. So uh, very interesting. Uh, oak is uh, wood which of course takes a very long time to grow but it's nevertheless very useful uh, wood uh, because it, it, it probably lasts a long time. Uh, but uh, you know, there's a lot of effort went into this not just in the placing of the posts but also in the using oak for the, the packing timbers. Uh, you may have expected them to use stone for the packing timbers or for the packing pieces around the oak timbers uh, rather than oak which seems a bit wasteful but it is indeed what was done. Uh, then in 2002 there were another set of excavations carried out this time it was ourselves from the Centre for Archaeological Fieldwork at Queen's. In partnership with the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, uh, we carried out a joint excavation in advance of the construction of a house. And uh, uh, our findings were very interesting from this project as well. We found uh, remains of several palisades. We found a really long palisade, or a really well preserved palisade here, a really long stretch. And then we found a second palisade, and then we found a third stretch of palisade quite close into the road with a number of uh, subsidiary features uh, around it. Uh, this is the, uh, the approximate position of our excavation and also Oliver Davies' excavations overlaid on modern LiDAR data. Uh, uh, just to give you an idea of uh, its position in the landscape. Interesting, this is LiDAR data from which the the, uh, the undergrowth has not been removed, so it gives you an idea of the difference between the LIDAR before and after removal of undergrowth. Uh, this is what we first saw whenever we got on site. Uh, a team from the Northern Ireland Environment Agency had uh, uh, monitored this uh, uh, when topsoil was being removed by machine, a uh, team led by uh, Dr. John O'Keefe, and they uncovered this uh, long linear dark uh, feature in the earth which we then excavated. Uh, it became quite quickly apparent as we excavated sections of it that it had originally contained posts. You can see some of the post pipes here. Uh, the post pipes or post holes uh, pressed into fill of the gully, fill of the policy and trench, uh, the foundation trench. You can see in this small section of one meter Alone, there are uh, four posts, each one with a diameter of about uh, 20 centimetres. So, uh, big stout wall, big stout oak posts. Uh, some of the oak posts, well, the entire wall seems to have been burned, but some of the oak posts, the combustion was, was almost complete. Uh, they were completely reduced to uh, charcoal, and that's very unusual. Uh, very difficult to do, actually, accidentally. You really need to set out to reduce things to charcoal for it actually to happen because the amount of heat and the time taken to do this and the low oxygen environment nearly needs to be constructed. It doesn't really happen accidentally, and that's very interesting. There's a, a photograph of a different burnt timber, and you can see the same things again lots of red earth, and then the burnt timber uh, entirely combusted. We were able to lift these out in their entirety. Unfortunately, however, Although we could still see the ring structure, it was uh, warped by the uh, by the combustion, and it wasn't suitable for dendrochronological dating. And this is uh, a photograph of the uh, the excavated fully excavated trench with Lucy Chapman in the background. And uh, this uh, fully excavated trench, you can get an idea of the scale of the foundations here. This is a big fence, and it's not on its own. There are at least two other palisades on this. Uh, west side of the road. And there you can sort of see an overview again. See the two palisades up roughly where the A is, and then a third palisade just tucked inside the road, but which really has a very small uh, section of. And there's a, you can see under excavation actually, part of the uh, palisade on the, uh, the closest to the road. And uh, a little bit of a shallow gully or ditch. Uh, just a little bit closer into the road uh, than the Palisade Trench. We did actually get a sample from the base of this ditch, which is quite an ancient date, uh, but we radiocarbon dated it, but we're not entirely sure if it was in its original location. It may have been washed in from somewhere else. This ditch may not be that old. Uh, and just another one of the subsidiary features, just a little bit of a, 
a gully uh, of one certain purpose that had run behind the uh, behind the palisade uh, that was closest to the road. Uh, I mentioned radiocarbon dates earlier on. This is a plot of the radiocarbon dates and the dendrochronological dates. The dendrochronological dates are the five dates at the bottom of this uh, graph. You can see that the, the blackened area where the dendro dates is much smaller than the black area for the radiocarbon dates. These black areas are the reliable estimate, if you like, of the age of the sample. And you can see, uh, without needing to be a statistician, that uh, uh, dendrochronology is a much more precise dating method than radiocarbon dating. Radiocarbon dating, uh, it varies for a number of technical reasons, depending on the type of sample and depending on the era, as to how precise it can be. But uh, Iron Age uh, dates, uh, for a number of different reasons, uh, tend to have quite a big uh, calibration wobble, for want of a better word, on them and uh, are, are less precise than uh, radiocarbon dates in other periods and are much less precise in den than dendrochronological dates. But nevertheless, leaving all that aside, I think we can pretty much infer from this that most of the activity at the Dorsey is happening in the first two centuries BC. The bits of the calibration curves, the bits over on the left-hand side here, are probably caused by a combination of calibration effects and also the fact that we're dating oak in these cases, and oak may have been uh, oak may have been growing for two or three hundred years before before it's actually cut down and used. So there's always a potential latency in an oak date if you can't identify what bit of the tree the oak wood comes from. So it could potentially be from the heartwood of the tree. It could be three hundred years older than a piece that was just under the bark. So. That, that that probably explains some of the wobble in, in these dates. And I think if we think of activity in the Dorsey as being in the first two, 250 years uh, before Christ, roughly, I think we're in uh, the ballpark uh, for the dating of this monument. This is uh, the LiDAR data again, with the, in green, the three palisades that we found in 2002, and in blue, the proposed location of our trench for 2019. Uh, we had ever since 2002 wondered, you know, uh, we've got three palisades that appear to be all running parallel to a road. Surely there's a palisade on the other side as well. That was a big question that we'd had uh, and we desired to answer. And then the opportunity with the uh, Ring of Gully and Landscape Partnership presented itself to excavate at the Dorsey. Uh, we grabbed it with both hands. Uh, Siobhan McDermott, Dr. Siobhan McDermott, our uh, geophysicist, uh, did a geophysical survey on the fields at, at either side of the road and she found what she believed to be uh, an indicator of something that might be a charred palisade just tucked inside uh, the fence on the right hand side of the road so that became the target for our trench. Uh, we opened the trench uh, in exactly the location where she suggested the geophysical uh, anomaly was and right enough we came immediately down on uh, a linear uh, grey stain in the soil just like the ones that we found in 2002 on the other side of the road. You can see there the trench just after the sod's been removed. Uh, the grey uh, line uh, against the, the creamy uh, subsoil beside it. Uh, this is after we started to excavate a little bit down into the palisade. You can see uh, the charcoal is getting more intense, uh, and the charcoal was concentrated around the sides, almost as if these were burnt packing posts or packing timbers, uh, like you saw in some of the other uh, photographs beforehand. Uh, we're now getting down to the stage in the excavation where we can see individual uh, post pipes or post holes in the fill of the construction gully or the palisade gully. Uh, you can see them quite well in the shadowed bit of that photograph also. So this is a very interesting photograph. This photograph shows the cross-section of the, uh, the uh, Palisade Trench under excavation. And you're be we were beginning to notice at this stage that there looked to be several different phases of construction and burning evidence for several different phases from the stratigraphy. Stratigraphy is the science of the interleaving of, and interweaving of soil layers. And it's, the, it's, it's one of archaeology's greatest tools for trying to figure out the, the sequence of events on an archaeological site. And here we were beginning to detect 
several phases of construction and reconstruction. If you notice uh, on the what's currently the floor of the excavation, although the excavation wasn't complete and had to go deeper, the floor of the excavation was a charcoal area. That was a post pipe. But it was a post pipe which is earlier than the ones I've just shown you. The ones I've just shown you were cut from, from, from a higher level. They were cut from the level of this dark uh, stain that's in the cross section. Uh, and uh, we, we really have, we can, we can begin to see evidence for two or three phases of construction and then apparently deliberate destruction uh, by burning at this site. Just going to go here, have a little bit of a look at a fly through of the uh, the excavation taken from photogrammetry. That was a great technique that we have now. Uh, photogrammetry allows us to sort of to build up a 3D model and then animate it. And just you can see here, I'm just going to pause it for a second. You can see the deep Palisade Trench. This is before the end of the excavation, uh, so it's not yet complete. And also here in the middle of the trench, there are some other features. And these features we initially thought were very superficial, but they turned out to be uh, quite a deep gully, about 60 centimetres wide and 60 centimetres deep, uh, packed with stones and with areas of concentrated charcoal in it. So it seemed to have some sort of a timber pack or timber wall packed with stones, which had burnt down at some stage. Uh, and our interpretation based obviously on only a fairly small excavated area is that it's the remains of some sort of a structure possibly a lean-to that was built up against the uh, against the palisade itself maybe it was some sort of another guard hut or a shepherd's hut or or or, or some sort of herds person's hut uh, we will we can't really uh, be certain uh, but uh, uh, it's a great great technique this for letting you an idea of the excavation even if you haven't been there. So this photograph uh, is a cross section of one of the the cross sections through the palisade after the excavation has been completed, and you can get a good idea of the depth of this foundation cut. It's at least uh, a meter from the current ground surface, and it's about eighty-five meters from the old subsoil. So it's easy to imagine it was originally about a meter. From the original ground surface as well, so it's quite a, quite a deep trench, and when it's a meter deep with big posts in it, I mean that means that the posts can can rise for several meters above the ground. So this was a really substantial and a very tall uh, palisade, and you can get indications here as well of the interweaved layers of charcoal layer here, then a sort of a a layer of sort of yellowish. Uh, clay or silt derived from the, the, the side walls, then another charcoal deposit, then more collapsed and yellowish silty material, then more charcoal material, and then right down onto the base of the uh, right down onto the base of the trench. So you can see several attempts to uh, recut and probably replace timbers in this, which are then each time uh, burnt down. So we, we, we have a potentially very interesting uh, stratigraphic uh, sequence here uh, to be teased. And on the other side uh, of the trench, uh, you can see the same sort of thing. Uh, multiple layers of uh, charcoal and then uh, uh, creamy fill derived from the, the, the other soils in the area. Uh, another layer of charcoal. And then underneath it all, uh, a post pit of a post hole, which had long, e even in the existence of this site, had been removed and, uh, and, and re-dug again. So if you like, this post pit in the bottom is probably the first period of use of the Dorsey. And the rest of what you see is its gradual uh, reuse over a period, well, as yet indeterminate period of time. So this is uh, more or less the same photo again. Uh, uh, just uh, the same post hole, which is looked around from the other side. So you can see the other cross section. You see some very similar sort of lamination going on. So at the Dorsey we have a palisade, a very impressive palisade, on the east side of the road, and we have several palisades, one of them, one or two of them, very impressive, on the west side of the road as well. Uh, we may well have further palisades on the east side of the road. Our geophysical survey and our excavation only not so far, uh, because of limitations of time and resources, but it may well be that we have several palisades in the east side. Uh, as well as the West. So what does it all mean? Well, 
one reason why you might take a palisade, or sorry, take a palisade trench, fill it with, with posts and, 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 and place it beside a road would be to either restrict traffic, keep it on the road, or else restrict uh, people or beasts perhaps who weren't in the road wandering onto the road. And uh, there seems to be no doubt that the Dorsey is, is intimately connected with this ancient road, this Sleem and Lurker that runs through it. And uh, these posts, these palisades, uh, I suppose it's a moot point whether you could say they're part of the Dorsey or whether you could say they're part of the Sleem and Lurker. Uh, they relate to both, really. Uh, the fact that they're burnt is very interesting. Burning uh, cross culturally uh, is. And, and, and also in different time periods uh, is, has been seen as a way of liberating the spirit, if you like, uh, from the, 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 the material remains. If you think of the burnt offerings in the Bible, or if you think of the practice of cremation, it's very much about the instant liberation of the soul from the earthly remains, avoiding the, uh, the, the necessity of decomposition, which otherwise, in many countries, in many cultures, uh, is the point at which the the soul or the spirit is believed to be freed from the human remains whenever decomposition has taken place. And likewise, sometimes when cultures uh, of various different times and places uh, deliberately destroy objects by fire, part of the reason why they're doing it is to liberate the spirit, uh, to set it free, if you like, from its material bounds. So there is just a possibility that there's a ritualistic aspect to the construction of this uh, palisade and the other palisades that we got flanking the other side of the road, that it's not just purely uh, practical. Uh, so why would you want to do that? Well, I mentioned earlier in Metrical Dinshenikus and some recently translated texts, uh, poems in the Metrical Dinshenikus by a Russian academic, have, uh, have shown that uh, there were beliefs about all sorts of uh, spiritual entities, demons, ghostly creatures associated with these ancient roads. And uh, it's just possible that by building a policy and then committing it to the spirit world by uh, consuming it in, in a fire, you might actually be providing some sort of spiritual barrier to keep people off the road so as not to uh, harass uh, lonely travellers on dark nights. So there may be, there may be something in that. Uh, but uh, at this stage, uh, we want now to finish our project by uh, taking our saw samples. Uh, which we have from the different uh, strata on the excavation, processing them, getting as much environmental information from them as we can, uh, getting information uh, or data or raw materials uh, to potentially radiocarbon date. Uh, that's going to be our focus now for the next few months. And hopefully we'll, in a little while, have a lot more information to tell you about our excavation at the Dorsey and how it fits into our understanding of the Dorsey and how it's driving forward our interpretations for the future. Uh, just a final word, I'd like to thank very much uh, Oliver Herdy, uh, the landowner who allowed us uh, to dig in his land and also facilitate our geophysical survey. Uh, the McAllister family who owned the land on the other side of the road who also allowed us to carry out a geophysical survey and the Ring of Gullion Landscape Partnership team, uh, in particular Therese Hamill and Austin Henderson, without uh, without whom the project couldn't really have taken place, and who were always on site and always very helpful. Uh, I'd really like to give a shout out to the schools. The schools were fantastic. Uh, the children were so enthusiastic and so knowledgeable. Credit to their teachers and to their parents and to themselves. And uh, finally, we were delighted, absolutely delighted, by the local interest in the area. Uh, people were coming up to us with lots of interesting uh, tidbits of folklore and information about monuments. Uh, people's excitement was palpable, and that's uh, that's something which makes us feel very worthwhile. We feel as if we're we're doing a worthwhile job when people uh, give us such uh, such 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 an interested feedback. If you like, so uh, stay posted. Uh, there will be uh, sometime over the next few months uh, further developments as we get our lab work done, and when. Uh, that's done. Uh, updates will be posted on the Archaeology at Queen's Facebook page and also on uh, the Archaeology at Queen's YouTube channel. Okay, bye bye. <laughs>